Hello and welcome to Brokenomics and this episode I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by Simon Elmer who holds a PhD in history and art. He's the author of several books, very good books including this one and he is the co-founder of Architects for Social Housing which scrutinises housing policy. Simon, thanks very much for joining me. Thanks for having me, Dan. Now, before we get into it, because what I really wanted to to tackle with you was a lot of the COVID stuff, mm -hmm. because you were very good. You were very um, active early on in, in social media and pointing out some of the inconsistencies. Uh, but before we get into that, I just want to ask you a quick, easy question about the day job. So housing mm -hmm. policy, yeah. can you just reassure us that that exists in order to ensure that people get housed and as many people as possible can buy their own home? No. Oh. Um, it's kind of like COVID pol policy. It's like lockdown policy. It's mm -hmm. there to create a crisis. This isn't really surprising because there's been a housing crisis sort of since time began. Um, my company, Architects for Social Housing, we founded it in 2015. It was right in the middle of, um, I guess, the real focus in the housing crisis, particularly in London where I live, where it's exacerbated mm -hmm. because of the land prices are so high. Our particular focus was there is a program of what's called a state, council of state housing regeneration. Mm -hmm. And it's another one of those words like, oh, I don't know, sustainability. Regeneration means effectively demolishing the existing housing and redeveloping it as market sale properties. Okay. So it's a money-making thing. And we, we were kind of against that. We thought in the middle of a housing crisis, we understand crisis as a crisis of affordability and shortage of affordable homes. Yes. Um, knocking down council housing and social housing in general um, was, was okay, kind hence of Hence the name. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, because I mean, the the argument you often hear pushed back here is, oh, there's a shortage of land or something. But then it doesn't make any sense to me why house prices are also out of control in countries like Australia and Canada. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly it. You know, we went to, we were in a residency in Vancouver, which is not a place that's got a shortage mm -hmm. of land. And as you say in Australia, each country, each government has its own reasons for arguing it. In this country, it's things like there's a shortage of land, or there's too many immigrants coming in, or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, because it that's sounds not, vaguely plausible, doesn't it? It doesn't if you read the Daily Mail, I guess, or something like <laughs> yes. that. There is a huge amount of land banking. You won't be surprised to hear that the biggest developers, people who are building the most homes um, in London and across the UK, are also the biggest landholders as well. Um, it seems strange you have to kind of say this to people, but if you flood the market with your commodity, with your product, the value of that market is going to go down. If you restrain mm. um, production, the value is going to go up. So it's engineered, the housing crisis is deliberately engineered um, to push prices up. Um, and also, it also does something else as well. It changes the way that we live together. Um, it moves people out of the cities, particularly places like London. Um, it creates um, investments for foreign investors as well as local investors yeah. as well. Um, it does a lot of things. It's both a political and an e economic policy. So I, I, my, my joke on this is I noticed a few years ago that the um, the size of the illicit drug market in the UK was actually larger than the uh, the housing market. So my joke was that um, if you want more houses built, you should make it illegal <laughs> because effectively, what by by following the policies by sticking within it, you're you're getting to this arbitrary shortage. Whereas people just thought to the hell with it. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna work around this. You you might get a better outcome. Yeah. Okay. So let's jump to um um you know the the main uh, thrust of the argument. So um I enjoyed your book very much. Mm -hmm. Um I followed your um pushing back against the covid policy as it happened. Now there's so much that I could talk about but what I'm probably going to focus on is uh, chapter 4 from your book um The Road to Fascism as I've shown. Mm -hmm. Now there's a there's a key part of this which I wanted to read out um which is my interest for the purpose of this chapter is to contend that when the internal contradictions of a capital accumulation mm -hmm. reach such a stage that the existing social contract can no longer hold them together, yeah. society enters a period of revolution in which the contract is rewritten. And that fascism is the authoritarian form of that contract. Now, certainly the first part of that is very much the premise of brokenomics. And that's what I'm talking about on a consistent basis, that these internal contradictions have pushed us to a point where the system is no longer becoming functional. You sort of take it up a level mm. and you invoke the F word. Um, now, typically people tend to use that in a relatively unsophisticated way. It tends to mean something that I don't like. Why have you opted for that? And why do you feel that that's appropriate? Yeah, that's the kind of a big premise. The book was written as a sort of a, a question. I wanted to ask a question. And when I started writing the book, I didn't have the answer to it. I don't know if you got to the end in the conclusion, I sort of come to a conclusion and say, yes, I think fascism has returned. Um, 
When I first started writing about what was hap happening, in, particularly in the UK, the enormous number of laws that were being made, the, the violence of the police that were enforcing it, not just here but across the world, um, I didn't want to use this word fashion because, as you said, it's used as a kind of an insult. Yeah, yeah. And it, it, if you use it yourself in a descriptive way, you kind of lose – you know, people don't think of you as kind of a serious And it thinker. also sort of gives your opponents license to shut you down as yep. soon as you say it, because yeah. it, because we've sort of almost reached the stage where you're just not allowed to draw any um, comparison from history. Then we went into the winter of 2021, 2022, and you had things like, you know, maybe I should enumerate them to remember, to remind people. Yeah. You had things like the kind of the violence that was going on in Canada, where Justin Trudeau having kind of gone and dipped into the woke handbook of insults, then released the sort of paramilitary police on men and women who were working men and women who were basically trying to defend their rights not to be injected with experimental substances and to defend their jobs, you know, and their salaries as well. Um, in Austria, um, we were they were right on the cusp of making vaccination or injection called gene therapies uh, mandatory for the entire population. If you didn't, if you left your home, and you were caught by the police without proof of, you know, a green pass showing injection, you would be fined. And if you couldn't pay the fines, you would then go to jail. And they walked right up to that line, didn't they? They got like right the close to that. Or something. Um, in Germany, you had children being, in Germany, being forced to go to the front of the class every day. And, you know, this was uh, reported in uh, Das Bild, that, and say, had you been injected? And if not, why not? <laughs> well. um, so you had this kind of this extraordinary sort of level of violence. And, you know, in France, like now, as, as at the present, there was kind of a continuous violence when they try to mimic the sort of uh, the freedom convoy macron released you know these extraordinarily violent police upon them right. so i asked myself over that winter i was getting pretty scared because we were coming up to you know we'd had the mandates the, the for carers to have to be vaccinated to be injected we were on the very cusp of the of the the, the whole um, nhs workers being done and it was looking like it was going to cut to all of us and i was worried and i thought well if this isn't fascism what is it and that's when I started to write my book in February of 2022. But the question really was not like, is this fascism? But what can historical fascism, the period in Europe between the 20s and 30s, tell us about what's happening now? So is anything, it started out as much as a proposition, is, is yeah. does this fit? And you tried it on and you discovered, yeah. well, yeah, it does. Yeah. There's, if I can do it quickly, there's three kind of elements which I think the history of fascism. Fascism as a political economy, not an insult. Yes. Not merely as violence, but as a political economy, they can tell us something about what's happening now, what's ha been happening, what's going on. Um, the first of them is that human rights under fascism are suspended. Um, people right. maybe don't know, but the Third Reich, kind of an extreme form of fascism, um, the 12 years, it was under a state of emergency, it was declared under the Weimar Constitution, the constitution of the previous government, and it was still in place when the Third Reich was defeated. And under that, pretty much all the rights of the German people, not just the Jews or the communist or the, you know, the right. opposition, were suspended. Um, that's what we've had now. The, we found that all our human rights, and particularly the, kind of the, um, the key ones like freedom of movement, freedom okay. of expression, freedom of thought, freedom of conscience, freedom of association, freedom of your bodily rights and so on, were all lifted on the justification that they were contingent upon what the state declares is the common so, so just to get this right the the um all of the rights were taken from from the german people at that time and then the more favored groups started to get them back the people who the state were happy with had some of those states return uh, those rights returned whereas the the certainly the less favored groups they sort of doubled down and they made it tougher on them no i don't think i mean under the um First of all, the Enabling Act, which was in 1933, allowed the government to make laws by dictate. They didn't have to be ratified in the, the Reichstag. And as you probably know, we had 582 coronavirus justified regulations made in two years. It's almost one a day. Mm. And each of those statutory instruments had multiple regulations. We're talking about thousands of regulations. The police said they just didn't know how to police it because it was just so extraordinary, which was obviously very deliberate. And 537 of those statutory instruments didn't even go through Parliament. They were merely rubber stamped in, in, in 537, 537 did not go Parliament. Them. They were made into law without being presented to Parliament, without having a um, an assessment made of their impact, and without any evidence of their justification. Because it created an extraordinary environment in the country at the time where, like you say, the police did not know what they were supposed to be enforcing. So yeah. you, I, I remember scenes, and, and people are so quick to forget some of these yeah. details, but I remember scenes of police literally just arresting people who sat down on park benches, yeah. people who had gone for a walk, and, and the police officer decided that they had wandered too far from their house. Yeah. 
none of that was actually in the law, yeah. but they were simply. And I mean, you gave me an anecdote earlier of uh, of cases yeah. from um, the, the Freedom Marches where they did not know why they were doing the things no, they were doing. No, I mean, one of the very very few legal minds figures to kind of question this with Lord Sumption, Jonathan Sumption, yes. who was uh, Supreme Court Justice, mm. and is recognised as kind of our foremost authority on constitutional law. And he went out and very publicly said, this is a police state. This is when the police are making judgments about what, how they can act. And I think in response to those sort of early absurdities when Manchester police were kind of arresting people walking across the Pennines and stuff, mm. Johnson Sumption pointed out they had no, there was nothing in the existing regulations, brutal and extreme as they were, that justified doing that. And the head of the Manchester police wrote back to him and said, in a state of emergency or an emergency period, that's what we were in, emergency period, um, it's up to the police to make a judgment about what is right and wrong. <laughs> no, that not. is a police state. Um, so yes. the parallels with what, when you declare, when the state, the government declares a state of emergency, we're seeing it in France right now, this weekend. Um, our human well, rights are never out of them. They, they, they literally almost on all yeah. the time. The, um, our human rights suddenly mean nothing at all. Things that we think fundamental. So that's one thing that there's a parallel we can learn from. Yes. The other one is, which if we can move away from the Third Reich to um, Italian fascism, which of course was the first fascist um, government in, in, in Europe. We tend to forget that fascism, fascist governments pretty much ruled Europe for quite a long time. Um, you know, well, Europe and, was... and Franco died in his bed of old age. So, <laughs> so you know. Yeah. Um, the other thing that happens is you move from a democratic model. I know we've got a flawed democracy. All democracies mm. are flawed, but a model in principle to a technocratic model of governance. Mm. That means when <clears throat> the government itself, or the forms of government under which we are ruled, are not subject to a democratic process, either election or scrutiny or transparency. Mm. Now, the sort of laws that we are, not just rules, but also technologies, programs, because we're mm. moving now from a kind of a juridical model into a program and technologi technological model, they have been imposed not by our governments. The governments have enforced them, but they've been decided by yeah. global technocracies. So I've certainly so, noticed over my yeah. lifetime that the certainly the sense that you get from politicians is they have gone from attempting to solve the public's problems mm. to nowadays they are trying to solve the problem of the public. <laughs> yes, that's um, a good way of putting it. That, yeah. And um, so effectively, wh where you're coming out with this fascism angle is not so much, if, if you go to the roots of it, the historical roots of it, essentially what it is, it is a system where big government and big business reinforce each other yeah. to instill yeah. a set of behaviours, cultural norms, yeah. laws, the whole package, which serves the interest of big governments and, and, yeah. and big corporations, and they sort of reinforce and feed yeah. off each other. That's, that's, a, that's definitely a side of it. I mean, that's another... It's a parallel conversation about the role of ideology. Um, and I think this is kind of going into when fascism goes into kind of totalitarian states, which might we go back to later on, where the governance doesn't come from the top. Mm. That's kind of dictatorship, but where the people govern themselves, they survey themselves. Um, you know, where I've got figures on just how many denunciations were made to the police of the UK by the British people um, in the first sort of year or something like that. And it's kind of extraordinary. And we all know the kind of thing, you know, the press sort of turning on and calling people like us who didn't observe lockdown, who didn't wear masks, um, you know, made out of our T-shirt, who did, with, with no intention of getting injected with these experimental gene therapies, that we were murderers, we were endangering not just each other, ourselves and each other. Yeah. But also, we were a threat to the security of the state. Oh, there was and, there was terms like vermin being yeah. thrown around, and that's the kind of the third element. We zoom on to fascism, which I found repeated. Fascism, particularly in the Third Reich, um, was governed under a biopolitical paradigm. What I mean by that is the body itself becomes the object of a political strategy. A lot of the laws that were passed in the 30s, way before the war, in the, in the 30s, between 33 when the uh, Hitler government was, came in place, and 39 when war was de um, declared, were about controlling bodies. For instance, Jewish children were not allowed to go into schools with German children. Not simply because they were considered diseased. You know, there's that whole discourse around disease, which really defines the Third Reich. A lot of their laws are called things like laws for the protection of German blood and the German race. So Jews were seen not only as a source of infection bodily through disease, they were compared to vermin and so on, as we were, but their minds themselves, their, their ideas, they were considered 
um, instruments and bullshit. Oh, so there was a strong sort of ideological stuff. component. There was an ideological infection. stuff. So right. infection, and that kind of is what biopolitics is about. Because that's all. That was always the pushback at the time. Whenever sort of any historical comparison tried to be made, it's like yeah. well, they said, "Well, you know, you've chosen not to be vaccinated. Somebody can't choose to be Jewish or not. So the oppression is of a fundamentally different order because you've made the wrong decision." Well, what's behind that is the idea that questioning questioning the government, mm -hmm. questioning the probity of a pharmaceutical company to sort of pay 10 billion in fines over the last decade alone, um, questioning anything that comes from a doctor on YouTube kind of getting up and making a plea meant you were a danger to the state. So we weren't only infectious, we weren't only a source of contagion and infection, but our ideas themselves. And yet those are ideas are the very foundation of, again in principle, of Western democracy with all its flaws, mm. that we have freedom of speech, that we arrive at consensus through debate, um, that governance is open to questioning, um, transparency, and accountability. All and of those course, were thrown out. Censorship was a very heavy part of this because yeah. there were plenty of talk. I mean, I watched a um, a French Nobel Prize winner for immunology mm. being thrown off all of his social media platforms yeah. and basically cancelled from society because he was saying the wrong things. And in, in various countries, I mean, we, we, well, we all know the, list, the, the whole list of, of doctors from various countries who were effectively cancelled. Mm. So they yeah. tended to have to be those ones who had reached the pinnacle of their career and were the very mm. cusp of retirement mm. or already retired mm. because there was that that heavy censorship yeah. element that, that applied to it. That's, that's another element which I think we can learn from the history of fascism about what's happening. You know, there's that famous quote, it's anecdotal, I think, of Mussolini. And he said, fascism is when you cannot pass a cigarette paper between the interests of the government and the interests of big business. And the yes. international technocracies like the World Health Organization, like the World Economic Forum, obviously like the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, the European Commission itself, which is an unelected body, mm. These are technocracies which are profoundly merging mm. um, the, I wouldn't even say the interest, but the bureaucratic representative of our elected governments and big business. So we have now, you know, we have Pfizer telling us when, how many times we have to get injected with their products, which is a kind of a contradiction, isn't it? It's mm. like, how many times are we going to, get, going to use their product? It's it kind is, of asking, it is, it's, it's like yeah. asking, for instance, um, a war, an arms dealer, how, whether we should go to war. He's going to say, yes. Yeah, that's kind of, that is what we do, though. So. <laughs> and yet our governance was taken over by you know, corporations. It has been taken over completely at the moment. Yeah. Recently, another anecdote, quickly, let me get it in. Someone interviewed um, Keir Starmer, which God, God forbid he'll get in. It looks like he might become our next um, prime minister. In which case we're in real trouble because yes. it'll be like living under justice. Because well, he's even own. more technocratic than, uh, than yeah, Rishi somehow. Absolutely. And someone said to him, um, Parliament in Westminster or Davos, meaning the World Economic Forum, which he attended the annual meeting in February this year. Now, he is elected, he's in his position as elected representative of whatever constituency he is. And he's then being elected by his party members to be the prime minister, the leader of their party. Mm. He's got absolutely no mandate from Davos because Davos is a, te a technocratic body. And yet, like that, he said Davos. Yeah. And I thought, goodness gracious, what a – I was like, you should be you should be D whatever it is. You know, mm. you should lose your seat right now because you're not here to do Davos's yes. bidding. You're here to represent your constituents and the, the people who are foolish enough to vote for the Labour Party. And yet he had mm. no compulsion – about admitting this link that he had to it. At the Davos meeting, the World Economic, Feeding, uh, World Economic Forum annual meeting this February, I listened to it and the, the speeches coming out of there were kind of extraordinary. Um, there was no reference at all to democratic process. People were simply saying, we are going to implement this. You know, People like Tony Blair saying, we are going to implement digital ID, a system of digital ID, in countries across the world, whether they want yeah. it or not. To be fair, they did make a lot of references to the general public, but they were all references in terms of we need to overcome the general public, effectively what they're saying. I mean, I, yeah. I did a segment on the time on the um, the global risk reports that they put out. Yeah. And the global risk reports are split into uh, medium and long-term risks that they were worried about. Now, if you took those lists and you stripped out the flim-flam, so the environmental stuff, which they you know they, they yeah. can have no impact on, on extreme weather or anything like that. So you yeah. strip out all of that. All of their top concerns over the medium and long-term were societal cohesion, yeah. which it was very obvious that when you looked at it, what they actually mean is people pushing back yeah. against their agenda. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's another principle of biopolitics. You move from a juridical framework, and under the first year, first two years of lockdown, we had this swarm, as I said, these 582 laws and, of course, the Coronavirus Act. We're now moving into, because this is, this is my great concern at the moment, mm. 
Yes, lockdown was disastrous and he's killed and is killing a lot of people. Yes, the gene therapies were, were genocidal, have killed and will continue to destroy the lives and, and the health of, of billions of people. But we're now moving into a different phase, if you like, of the Great Reset. Um, and that is being implemented outside of any kind of juridical process. I can just name several of the key programs and technologies, digital ID, of which everyone's heard of, mm. um, central bank digital currency, which is going to mm. go in, coming quicker than I think people think. Um, Agenda 2030 and things like sustainable development goals, mm. environmental, social, corporate governance criteria, which have been in since 2015, 15 minute cities, um, you know, and of course, the real, the real doozer, which is the World Health Organization's pandemic treaty. So I've just written an article about yeah. these are all being implemented without us having any, I think, imagine most of the British public don't, they might have heard of digital ID, the others yes. maybe. But they won't know what they actually mean because there is no coverage of it in our in our media. There's no there's no so analysis. All of the, all of those great um, themes. Let's pick up on all of them. However, before we do, I just yeah, want to okay. finish off one aspect of the the definition side of this thing because you've 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 described your use of, of fascism and how it fits. Of course, these people today they do not describe themselves as such, mm. although they have no hesitation, as you gave with the Kira, Kira Starmer example, mm. of no no hesitation of describing themselves as technocrats. Um, what do you think about what actually is the difference between a technocrat and a fascist? Is it just a rebranding, effectively? Because it seems to me that you know one is the is the merger of you know big state and big government, yeah. and technocracy is effectively the same thing except run through international committees. Mm. And I, I, I'm not sure I it's, see what the difference. I mean, the, the term the term fascism itself is one which was coined by the people who were fascists. You know, they were yes. proud of it, and it referred back, as you you know, to the, the you know the Roman fasces with the the binding rods around the axe, and it kind yeah. of referred to the fact that we're stronger when we're unified. Mm. Um, fascism nowadays, because of the kind of the Holocaust industry, it's seen as sort of this ter terrible dark thing, and of course it was. Yes. There was a lot of hope in there as well. It's about a rebirth of these nations, which had been kind of destroyed by the right. Great War. It was a place of hope. The way we're doing it now is not we, but the, the, the people in power are doing it now. They're doing it in a different way, and people have kind of questioned me about this. Um, so are, They're doing are you it through of, fear. So are you saying that, that – <laughs> Technocracy is like fascism, but it just doesn't have the hope elements because that's not. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when you listen to the, w, the WEF, Carl Schwab got up this year and he said, "You know, we meet at a time when we've never faced more crises. Yes. You know, the listing of the list of the crises: the health crisis, the environmental crisis, the energy crisis, the cost of living crisis. I mean, now we've got the racism crisis, which is now a, a health thing. We've got uh, we've got pollution crises. We've got the geopolitical crisis. We live in a time of manufactured crises." I have to believe that yes. all these crises are manufactured. Yes. Going back to my background in the housing crisis, I know exactly that was that why that was manufactured mm. and what ends it was serve, serving and who who was doing it, what why they were doing it. Okay. These are all manufactured crises, but they do they do create a sense of fear. And certainly, yeah. when the historical fascism started, it had a great feeling of hope and binding people together. It was specifically about yeah. overcoming class differences as well because there was that hugely strong left in Europe at the time because of the, you know, the, the Great yes. Depression all that sort of stuff. It offered a hope, but it also identified a, an other, if you like to use that language, mm. something which had to be outside its unity. In my experience, unity is always found, always formed. It's a kind mm. of a, a closed circle by defining someone who's outside of it. We definitely had that. We are having it now. Whether that is someone who refuses to be vaccinated or who doesn't, you know, obey lockdown, who is not compliant. And in all mm. the new programs and treaties and agendas, which are being formulated by these or imposed by these international technocracies, they've always got articles in their laws for dealing with people like us. The pandemic treaty says very specifically that it wants to tackle disinformation, misinformation, and bring about, mm. and this is a quote, trust in our institutions and governments. Yeah. Now that is a fascist. The, the, yeah, the, and they're not going to do it through honesty. They're going to do it through shutting down the people who point out the inconsistencies that they make. So you talked about manufactured crisis, and that's a sort of thread I want to come back. To, a thread I want to come back to. So we started off talking about housing policy. So you've obviously got a, a background in dissecting policy. When you tackle this issue of a manufactured crisis, was there a policy component going into this? Was there policy that was being manipulated to assist this crisis into into being? Yes. Um, <clears throat> I wrote an article um, called Lies, Damn Lies and Statistics, Manufacturing the Crisis. And a lot of it is looking at um, the, the statistics on overall mortality, infection fatality rates, mm -hmm. and 
the number of deaths which were attributed to COVID-19 and where they came from, how that was done. But I started off by looking at the changes, the various, there were kind of five key changes, which maybe I can bring to mind, that created the, um, the framework in which this crisis could be manufactured. One of them was a simple change to taxonomy. That is, COVID-19, the disease, and SARS-CoV-2, the, the coronavirus uh, virus, were recategorized as, um, what do they call it, as, um, um, sorry, I've forgotten the name now. If, yeah. if, if, if a doctor identifies it, they have to inform the, uh, the, the public health, uh, the, the NHS right. or something. Okay. Um, that meant that, for instance, in the Coronavirus Act, so to, to, sorry, to, 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 so of, to turn this around a little bit, so are, are, are you saying that the changes in policy happened after the pandemic had already begun, or were there changes to policy that were were established prior to the event? Because I'm going to come on to something a bit later, yeah, about, um, on the financial side, about how things were the, manipulated the, the, in advance. The changes to how deaths were recorded, what how a, how a COVID-19 death was designated as such, yes. how PCR tests, for instance, were used, the protocols in yes. using PR, PCR tests, at um, you know, kind of thermal amplifications, which are mm. means that they are almost meaningless, completely meaningless. I would mm. say, as as a as a as a as a kind of a way of measuring if someone's actually got a disease. And um, there's a whole range of things, and they all came into effect very very quickly um, in between February and March 2020. Okay. Was there anything that preceded it? Any changes that would have? Because um, that's one thing I'm always wondering about: is were there steps taken before it had even been? Um, uh, cited as something to be concerned of that we're setting up this because I know there had been changes to the way that deaths could be reported in the fact that it, you know you had to be seen or identified and tested in some way and now uh, I remember very early on in the pandemic I can't remember if this was established beforehand or, or just early on in the pandemic it was sufficient for a doctor to effectively have a phone call with somebody yeah. and think that oh it's probably COVID therefore yeah. it is and therefore establish it as that yeah the World Health Organization released um, yeah a series of codes um, by which a COVID death could be designated as such. In care homes, for instance, which was a place where most of the deaths happened in those early yes. months, because um, very vulnerable people were locked in their homes. Personally, I don't think they died of anything like COVID. They died because 70% of people in homes have dementia. And if you lock people in their homes and you put a telephone, a television in front of them, terrorizing them, um, they go down very, very quickly. I know people who've got dementia and they go down very quickly. Where do you come on the midazolam aspect of this? I think that's an addition to it. Um, I don't. I haven't actually researched that myself. Okay. I've got a lot of friends who are kind of very insistent about it. Um, but the figures coming out in those early months, the figures coming out of the people who who the various institutions in the UK who monitor the health of the UK, in particular, heart disease, cancer, dementia, mm -hmm. um, they were all reporting that lockdown was killing people off at great rates. And at the end of the year, all those deaths. The vast majority of them were attributed to COVID-19, and in care homes, is kind of the example mm -hmm. I was using, it merely took the the administrator of the care home, a private person, a private, the, the person who ran the company, who no, not des didn't necessarily have any kind of medical background, to say that they suspected that that and was, that the was cause. sufficient. Okay. But most of the, you know, I haven't got them at my fingertips now, but most of it is you suspect it is, you think it is, or. Um, no, there's the criteria kind of meaningless. When you set as, up the criteria in that way, it's going to be very difficult to uh, recall somebody's death as anything other than COVID. Yeah. Uh, because if you even have the slightest suspicion at the same time as the media is constantly pumping out, and mm. this is this is everywhere. Because yeah. there was a genuine spike in excess mortality. Because I don't, I didn't trust any yeah. of those figures yeah. either. And I think I decided very early on, even though I didn't look at them as, nearly as much as you did, that probably the only reliable statistic was going to be um, total deaths, yeah, yeah. total excess deaths, yeah. because everything else could be manipulated too easily. And there was a spike, as you said. Yeah, and there was a spike, and yeah. it was only very early on, and yeah. it was focused around the care homes. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, maybe that explanation is sufficient by itself. I'm also very curious about the midazolam thing, and I'm wondering mm. if that's something that's going to come out of the WhatsApp messages. Um, I, I think it will, because, I mean, obviously this is a medication that is used to um, – well, to say it nicely, to ease your transition into yeah. the next life yeah. when you're at the end of your life. Mm. And a lot of that got sent into those care homes mm. Mm. Um, on the expectation that they were effectively going to have to triage uh, yeah. and manage the, yeah. the population through, through that method. Mm. And that was sort of justified on, on, on the basis that they were anticipating this huge pandemic mm. and that the NHS hospitals would be flooded. Mm. But in April 2020, when that huge death was happening in care homes, creating this giant spike, um, the use of 
care of um, uh, critical care beds in U- UK hospitals was at forty percent. It was actually lower than it had been for years. Those hospitals mm. were empty. The Nightingale hospitals, which you know huge sums of money were built, yeah. they stood empty. They were never ever used. The pandemic didn't manifest itself because it didn't exist. Yeah. The only thing we had was a spike, and the the care homes in April twenty twenty. That's when people died in great numbers. But even then, you know, at the end of the year. At the end of 2020, during this so-called civilization, you know, threatening pandemic, um, the in the UK, the the death rate, the overall mortality rate, so that is proportionate to the population and also the increasing age of the population, was as high as it been since 2008. It was the twelfth. <laughs> it was the twelfth lowest since records began in 1942. That, that was one of the games going around on Twitter, wasn't it? They they took the the uh, total number of deaths over a year. They took the the, the dates off them and reorganised them and said, okay, <laughs> point point to the year that the deadliest pandemic yeah. in history has occurred. And everybody or everybody basically went for what 1964, the um, that was the Hong the Kong flu was, or yeah. something. And as you say, you know, it, it, it was it was not out of line with anything other than 2008. Oh. And that. And people say, well, but it was higher than the last five years, which has been the lowest and you know, than the records began. But it also doesn't take into, into account that lockdown, lockdown restrictions, which isn't just simply people in care homes being kind of locked away and dying in considerable numbers. It's also when we, you re- withdraw medical care, diagnosis, yes. and treatment for 68.8 million people for two years. Yes. And guess what happens when that, that happens? That probably has an effect. People die, and yeah. they'll continue to die. There was a report by the... Uh, Office for National Statistics, Public Health England, um, the UK's actuary office or the government's actuary office, published in, I think, June or July 2020, and it made an estimation of the the deaths that would result from lockdown. And I've published these figures. I've never seen them published anywhere else, and they're extraordinary. They're predicting something like 80,000 deaths over the next five years. They were right. When, you know, Chris Whitty coming out and saying, we think the excess deaths in 2022 might have something to do with the fact that we withdrew care under lockdown. We all knew this. We looked around the world and we looked at comparable death rates in countries that weren't under lockdown. Oh, you can and see they that were much Sweden. lower. Yeah. So even though the, the mortality rate in the UK yeah. only went up a small bit, that's yeah. also when we killed people as well. The actual estimations of how many people actually died of this thing called COVID, hmm. it's very, very few. To watch the full video, please become a premium member at lotuseaters.com.